Welcome to the German Lutheran Church here in Waldenboro, Maine. My name is Jean Lawrence, and I am the president of, of, of the Historical Society, and I am also the coordinator for the auxiliary, which provides the hosts for the summer months when people come to visit the church. As you can see from the doorway over me, 1772 is when this church was built. It has an interesting history. It is very old and is one of, as it says on the plaque over here, one of the three oldest churches in the state of Maine. And the cemetery and the church on this plaque tells us that they are on the National Register. And so we are very proud of this building and we are very proud of the history that is a part of this building. We're going to go inside, but before we do, I want you to look around and you will see many gravestones. Most of the stones around this part of the church are quite old. You will also see flags, and those are flags for veterans who have died in various wars over the years. The one closest to the church is for a young man by the name of Gardner Swartz, who died in the Civil War, and he was only 17 years old, but he came from Waldeboro. We uh, are very proud of all who have served and who are buried here in these many area graves. Um, they are called yards, a grave yard. The yard is where the family had their stones and were all buried close by one another. This is the old part of the cemetery, the new part of the cemetery. You have to go up the hill and there are all new sites on the top of the hill. So these are the very old ones and it is interesting to come here to visit the church and to walk among the gravestones and read the stories on the stones. This part that you are looking at today of the church is called a vestibule. It's a place where visitors are greeted, where you sign the guest book. And it was put on the church quite a, quite a while after the church had been built. It was put on because a balcony was added to the church and they needed to have stairways to get up into the balcony. So we're going to come inside and we're going to look a little bit at the vestibule. Now. To get in here, you have to have a key, a great big key, which I will hold up in a minute. A nice big key to open the door and to come in. And then you sign the guest book and then you can go up the stairs to the balcony. That's where I like to sit. Um, but however, there's a story about all the pews downstairs that we'll go on and talk a little bit about. Come in through the double doors, and as you come into the church, you find that it is quite large, and it's a very interesting church. Now, the people who came here and built this church were German immigrants. They came in starting in 1742, and for about 10 years, different groups of them came. When they came to what we call Waldeboro today, there was not much here. And they had been promised by General Waldo, who was a proprietor, a person who by the king was given land to try to sell to people to come to uh, build homes on, so forth. However, when they got here, there was nothing. And it kind of is uh, an interesting story of how long it took them to create the town. For when they came, there was no town, no church, no accommodations awaited them. As the ship, the Lydia, sailed up Broad Bay in 1742, there was only wilderness, a touch of autumn color, and a few uninhabited cabins. Small clearings were found as they came, seeking land and a home and a hearth, a place to call their own. 
Mother Nature gave a respite of eight weeks for the erection of some crude cabins, floors of clay or flat stone with rough timber walls, chinked with straw and mud. The land from the point where they landed up the east side of the river was parceled out into broad tracks called broad farms. Activity began, winter came, and the river froze. Ice blocked all communication with the outside world, and the settlers struggled to survive while they were seeking land, a home, and hearth, a place to call their own. Oh, there were Indian raids, politics, disease, and the never-ending collection of stones. But these did not overwhelm the pioneers. Simple mills at the falls were built for soaring needed timber. Gardens were planted and cattle tended as life flickered along the river's shores. These hardy souls persevered. They had come for land, home, and hearth, a place to call their own. They persevered. They wanted a home. Years passed, and two more ships, the Priscilla and the St. Andrews, brought more eager souls to settle on the Dutch man's neck. And the river was charted, and the land was surveyed, and hearths were laid. Their numbers and their hopes swelled, and at the head of the tide, a town was born. The migrants had found a place of their own. The migrants had found a home. That's some lines from a poem called Broad Bay Beginnings that I wrote a long time ago after I found out the story of the settling of Waldeboro. Now, these immigrants came, and for many of them, they were second sons in Germany, which meant that they would not inherit any of their parents' land. And so that's one of the reasons that they wanted to come here. They did not come for religious reasons like the Puritans down in Massachusetts did. Instead, they wanted a home. They wanted a place of their own. They were Lutherans, all of them who came. There were three groups of them, Moravian Lutherans, there were Reformed Lutherans, and they were just plain old regular Lutherans. They originally had a church down on Dutch Neck. That was just a rude cabin. And after a while, they realized they wanted a, a better church, and they wanted to have it over on the east side of the Madomic River, which runs right up here. The head of the tide is right up here at the bridge. So one of the farmers who had a broad farm, now a broad farm was a, about 100 acres. And so he gave a portion of his farm to build a church. And he gave this to the reformed Lutherans. And there were about 30 of them, 30 of them, that decided they were going to build. And they did. And what they built was just this basic structure that you see here, not the vestibule. There was nothing in it, just rude benches that they had. No pulpit, no nothing. And that's where they worshiped for a number of years. They then realized that there wasn't very much room for a burial site for the people that were a part of their congregation that died. And so they also knew that General Waldo has set aside some land on the other side of the river, that would be right here where we are now, for either a church or a school, and also, if it was a church, a parsonage, a place for a minister to live. Well, they really didn't even have a minister. They had a school teacher for a while, and they had members of the congregation that helped in their worship, but they didn't actually have a minister. So they decided that they would wait and build a new church. And then they said, no, we'll take what we've got apart. And they did. They took the 
basic frame apart and waited until the river froze. And when the river froze, they piled all the pieces of it on a great big sled, or sledge as they called it. And it was pulled by oxen. And they pulled all of the, re the building uh, parts up across the river, up the hill, up, way up to this hill, and then they put it all back together. And that's how this church happened to be here. So originally built in 1772 over there, and then when it got to be uh, 1794, the winter of 1794 and 95, they brought it across in the ice. So actually this has been here physically since 1795, but the building itself started in 1772. Now, how did it get to be the way it is today? How did it get to have a beautiful pulpit that, if you can see it, is what is called a wine glass pulpit? Because the wine glass is below, and this looks like stone, but it isn't. It's wood, and it's carved, and the pulpit sits in the top. The minister got up into that pulpit by climbing up the stairs. How did that happen? Where did all of these pews come from? They're very, very individual. Um, as you look at them, each has a little door on it when the winter doesn't make it hard to open. And there are seats that go around. So not everybody sat forward. Some sat looking out the windows. Some sat looking back at the door. And of course we had, and they had, no heat at all. There's no heat in this building. There is no water in this building. There is no electricity, no lights. And so they brought in a cauldron, probably a big iron pot, coals from their fires, from their fireplaces. And when they came and entered the church with the family, they put the coals in the center on the floor, and they all sat close to each other, and their body heat kept them warm in the winter. They had no problems in the summer. This is the coolest spot in all of Waldeboro, I believe, on the hottest day in the summertime. It's beautiful up here. Breeze is always blowing. So, so how did they build these? What they did is each family that wanted a pew gave money. They literally bought their pew. All of the pews are numbered. You can see four, five, six, so forth and so on, all the way around. And there are people who come to visit the church once a year, and they always try to sit in their family's pew. Now, not all people uh, know wh where their family pew was, and not everybody that comes here uh, in the summertime to the one service that we have on the first Sunday in August at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, not everybody knows where they, uh, their family originally sat, if they are descendants. But a lot of visitors come who aren't descendants at all. They just love the old church. There are many architects who come to see this church. And every architect that I have ever had that has visited the church has taken out his notebook and taken out his rule and measured and measured and measured and measured all over the church. And I've wondered why, why are they doing that? So I asked one of their wives one day, one of them, and she said, oh, architects do that when they go to a very old site and they send the information in to a central site so that if anything ever happened to this church, they would have a record so that if possible, it could be reconstructed. And I thought that was really interesting. There are people that are very interested in old buildings and historical sites. Well, as the years went on, they finally got a minister who could speak German. Because, of course, the old people who came were not interested in learning too much English, enough to get along. 
but they wanted to hear their German language. And over here on the wall are uh, some photos. One is of a husband and wife, and that is Reverend Starman and his wife. And Reverend Starman was really uh, the, the uh, last, one of the last uh, German ministers of the church. There was another man who came before him, a minister by the name of Ritz, R-I-T-Z, and he was also um, beloved by those who were here and worshipped. The other picture on the wall is of Conrad Heyer. Conrad Heyer was a local boy. When I say local, he came with his mother and his brother um, early on one of the ships that came here. And he lived to be over 100 years old. And he's a very special man because he was the song leader for this congregation. Now, they didn't have any organ, they didn't have any piano, but Conrad had a wonderful voice. He knew all the hymns, and he had a pipe that he would play, sort of like a little flute, and he would lead the people in the singing, and they loved him very much. He grew up to be a, a man who dearly loved this country, and when the American Revolution started, he was not content to be a local militiaman. He wanted to fight with George Washington as a continental soldier. So he and a couple of guys from Walderboro went down to Boston. Probably they went by boat. And they signed up down in Boston and they became continental soldiers and fought with George Washington at Valley Forge. They became part of George Washington's personal God. And they were very, very proud of that. And they served as his personal God for all the years of their enlistment. So Conrad was very, very well known in Waldeboro. Now, he used to walk to church. And even in his 90s, he would walk to this church from his daughter's farm over in Nobleboro. And that's a good hike. He loved his church. His faith, his farm, and his family were the three things that were important to Conrad Heyer. And because he was so old, everybody knew him. Well, he died in the wintertime, in February. And they buried him on the farm. And in those days, they didn't have communication like we have today. And when the people in the town found out that he had passed away, they said, well, he can't be buried on the farm. We're going to have to put him here in the German cemetery. That's where he belongs. So they got the town to give a burial site for him, and they had a big service. And they had it a memorial service right here in this church. And military units from all around came to give tribute to Conrad Heyer. And so he looks like a grumpy old man, as some little young people have told me, but in fact, he really was not. He really was a patriot, one that will always be remembered. He was one of the first revolutionary war veterans to have a photograph taken. And probably he didn't have any teeth when he had that picture taken, so he kept his mouth kind of shut. Now, this church today is not an active church. In other words, we don't have a congregation that comes here every Sunday. Instead, the church and the cemetery are run by a board of trustees. Um, Tim Weston is the chairman of the board presently. Um, they take care of all of the needs of the church and the cemetery. And they have a cemetery keeper by the name of Dana Davis, who cares for all of the site and who looks out for all of those who buy new sites up on the top of the hill and have services there. 
this uh, is essentially provided for from bequests that past people have left to the trustees to invest or for special um, projects that take place. Along with the Board of Trustees is the ladies auxiliary of the German church. And they take care of having people sit here in the church in the summertime. They serve a collation after the uh, August first Sunday service out on the lawn. And uh, we try to do our best to welcome people to the church. Now, a lot of people say, well, why are you so particularly interested in this church, Jean? Well, I'm interested in this church for another reason. I have always loved the work um, of the artist Andrew Wyeth. And one of his paintings that he did is called Maiden Hair. It is a painting done inside this church of a young woman sitting right here in this front pew. And you can go online and look up Andrew Wyeth Maiden Hair, all one word, and you will see that painting. Now the girl in that painting was named, and still is, Elaine Benner. I knew Elaine from the time she was about two or three years old. Her husband and my, her father and my husband were high school and schoolhood friends and remained friends over the years. And so I knew her and her family. She had several sisters and a brother. I knew them well. And when I realized that Elaine was the girl in the painting, I asked her some questions and she shared with me. We still write to one another. She does not live in Waldeboro anymore, um, but we keep in touch. And she told me about how Andrew Wyeth happened to paint her picture. She was 17 and she was riding her bicycle home on Friendship Road from a job mowing lawns. And he went by her in his Stutz Bearcat, which is quite a fancy car, and he stopped. And he saw her blonde, blonde hair, and she, and she had, has a very Germanic look about her. And he said to her, um, do you live around here? And she said, yes, I just live up there. And he says, is your mother home? She said, yes. And he said, uh, uh, I'd like to talk to her. So she said, okay, come on, follow me. And he went and he talked to Elaine's mother. Her name was Elsie. And he said, I would like to paint your daughter's picture in the German church. My name is Andrew Wyeth. Well, Elsie didn't really know who Andrew Wyeth was. And she wasn't going to say yes right away. So she said, I'll have to talk to my family. Well, what? When she talked to her family and found out who he was, they all said, yes, yes, definitely, let him, let him paint Elaine. So he came back the next day and she said, okay, all right. And she sat and he sketched many sessions during that summer. And he never set up his easel or anything. However, he stood probably here and there as he sketched her. In the painting, she is sitting and she's more or less kind of looking down. She has a wreath of flowers on her hair. Um, afterwards, she told me, she said, uh, I did sit for him with the blouse and everything on, she said, and he sketched that. But she said, I never ever had a wreath of flowers on my hair. He put that on later. She and Andrew Wyeth and his wife became very, very good friends. He was wonderful to her family. He actually let her drive his sports car on occasion. He used to, after they finished their sketching, buy a bag of sweet corn and take it home to uh, the family and the kids and 
Elaine and her mom would have a corn feast with Andrew Wyeth. Other times he would buy ice cream and he would bring it home to the family for them to enjoy. He was a wonderful, wonderful man as well as a terrific artist. And I think that it's a wonderful story that we have uh, a painting of this church done by a famous, famous painting, painter, and that for me, it's a blessing that I know Elaine and that I am still connected with her. And so when children come to the church from a Farnsworth Museum program that uh, is done usually in the fall, it is my pleasure to welcome them and to tell them all about the church. They go up in the balcony, they create stories about what it must have been like to be a, a young person having to go to church here when they were just uh, freezing cold in the middle of winter. Or they tell about Elaine and the story that I tell them. It's a joy to work with the young people. It's a joy to share the story, not only of this wonderful church, but also of a, an artist who created a fantastic painting that many, many people enjoy. So as I leave you today, I hope that you will come and visit us in the months of July and August. One o'clock to four o'clock, we are here. You don't have to pay a thing, it's free. We do have a contribution box if you want to give a contribution. But basically, just come and bask in the beauty of this simple church. A church that for many, many years served an immigrant congregation that became citizens of Waldeboro. It's been my pleasure to be here with you, and I hope you'll come and visit.